It was intended for flight, but for reasons unknown, was never used. It did not travel through the air, but instead has traveled through time. Buried in the ground, it has spent generations waiting to tell its story. And now, its time has come. Its story is steeped in tradition and speaks of ancient history. Its story is a legacy of storm. place of wonder, a battleground of gods. This area may have been seen as both by those who visited between 2000 BC and 1600 AD. They came to this rare exposed bed of Onondaga flint to create the stone tools they needed to survive, including thousands of spearheads, also known as projectile points. As a result of this 4,000 years of use, one of the most important archaeological finds of its kind in eastern North America is located in Fort Erie, Ontario. There's something extraordinary about Fort Erie. This is simply unparalleled. Archaeologists have found millions of artifacts about two feet below ground in a dark layer of earth called a paleosol an ancient layer of aboriginal debris containing early ceramics, simple stone chips, and complete tools made of flint. New meaning and a greater understanding of these artifacts comes from working with the indigenous community who are learning to value the work being done. They're, they're like messages from the past, and they're coming up because we need to learn them now. The town of Fort Erie is located on the northeastern or Canadian shore of Lake Erie, at the head of the Niagara River, across from Buffalo, New York. The town of 30,000 is known for its scenic beauty and rich history. In fact, its name comes from a British garrison built during the War of 1812. Fort Erie is also the Canadian terminus of the Peace Bridge one of the busiest ports of entry to Canada. Construction of the Peace Bridge began in 1925 and was dedicated to 100 years of friendship between the United States and Canada. The bridge captured the public's imagination and its opening ceremony, attended by heads of state and royalty, was called the greatest day in the history of the Niagara Frontier. Since that time, the bridge has proven to be a vital link between the two countries, with millions of passenger and commercial vehicles crossing every year. In 1992, to better serve growing commercial traffic, the Peace Bridge Authority began work on a truck inspection facility on the Canadian side of the bridge. There was, however, an area of concern. In the 1960s, the remains of more than 300 indigenous people were discovered in a burial site near the plant facility. In order to ensure that burials would not be disturbed and that artifacts would be protected, archaeologist Dr. Ron Williamson was called to monitor the construction. Williamson and a dedicated team of archaeologists have been called back repeatedly to oversee construction projects by the town and the bridge authority. And with each visit, they learn more about the site and its three major periods of occupation. Starting at about 4,000 years ago, there's almost a continuous occupation of the site. First with a culture we call Genesee, and then there's another really uh, well-known and very complex occupation which is called Meadowood. And then the third occupation that's very strong on the site is the transitional woodland period. It's important to realize that 
When I use the word Genesee or meadowwood or transitional woodland, these are terms that archaeologists use to refer to styles of stone points or styles of pottery. And it's an easy way to, if you like, categorize the artifacts that we find in the lifestyles. We don't really know what these people called themselves. It's not possible to tell that from the archaeological record. The archaeological record includes everything that is found at a site. Detailed notes are taken, and maps are created to show where each artifact or important feature was found. At the Peace Bridge site, food remnants, including plant and animal remains, have been found in ancient garbage pits. Human burials have been noted, and small stains in the soil are also recorded, as they can show where house structures once stood. By far, the greatest contribution to the archaeological record at the site was made by the artisans who turned flint into projectile points. We refer to it as flint napping. This is a stone flaking technique, and it basically starts with a block of flint, which is then reduced to a hand-sized piece of stone. From there, however, the tool used to remove the flakes changes to an antler. Uh, thus, smaller flakes are taken off, and then finally, very careful removal of small flakes to do the final shaping of the object. What looks to uh, us like it would take forever to make, to an accomplished flint napper would only take an hour or so. The nappers at the site produced millions of artifacts, but there are still questions about who they were and how they lived. Questions that are not answered by the archaeological record. Increasingly, archaeologists are relying on the indigenous community for additional insight. Working with Aboriginals has become very important to archaeology because we have a particular worldview, that of a Western worldview, and when we look at an object, we see it from those eyes. Whereas when we work with Aboriginal elders and traditionalists, they bring to that object, the, the artifact that we might find, a completely different perspective. And they are able to teach us what the meaning of that object is in their culture. And that brings so much more to our understanding of the archaeological record. The indigenous perspective can profoundly affect how a site and its artifacts are viewed. Through indigenous eyes, the Peace Bridge site may have been seen as sacred the location of a deadly battle between gods. In the Iroquoian creation story, and in particular the Huron one, there was a woman named Atensik who falls from a hole in the sky world onto the back of the turtle. All the other sea mammals dive down and bring mud onto the back of the turtle, creating the world that we live on. She has a daughter, and that daughter gives birth to Twins. One is named Yushkaha and the other is named Tewiskaran. There was a struggle for who was going to predominate. The Yushkaha strikes Tewiskaran so hard that Tewiskaran's blood flows onto the ground and becomes Tewiskara, which is the Huron word for flint. Frozen blood in stone uh, forms our weapons, our dangerous things, our projectile points, our knives. And, and so uh, it, it imbues the idea of the flint with, this, with the creation story, but also with uh, a, an element of great respect. The interesting implication of that, of course, is that stone means so much more to the nappers who are making it and to the people who are using these stone objects. Um, certainly we have an understanding of these objects now as having both secular value and sacred value. It's, I think it's very important for archaeologists to remember that these objects obviously have day-to-day -day functions, but they also have huge sacred value because they're made of the blood of gods. It must have been powerful if that was the actual place where the battle between the twins took place. That must have been just beyond awesome. I think it was electrifying, hence the respect for the place. Hence the sanctity of the place. Hence the desire to actually return to creation by being buried there. And where they were laid to rest was very meaningful. I think this was an extraordinarily sacred place.
There is little evidence of occupation at the site earlier than 4000 BC. Extensive flooding before that time washed away most of those artifacts. This projectile point, which dates to about 9000 BC and the first occupation of the area, is one of the few that have been found. Changing lake levels would continue to affect the occupation of the site. The water would rise, and for hundreds of years, the flint would be unavailable. But each time the water receded, mining of the flint would begin again by a new group whose culture and lifestyle was hundreds of years removed from that of the previous occupants. All that is known about them is based on the findings at the site and how they're being interpreted by archaeologists and the indigenous community. One of the major periods, if not the major period on the site, is called Genesee, what archaeologists refer to as Genesee. Now, they made a particular stone point for their spears, which looks like a pine tree with a stem. There's also a huge amount of debris on the site that's created as the mappers make these points. In a particular one meter square or a three foot square, we might find several thousand uh, pieces of flint that's discarded as these points are being made and we might find point fragments because they broke during manufacture, we might find pieces that broke because of use, we might find also pieces that in making them they just weren't happy and they rejected them. The people who made these were probably living in small hunter-gatherer bands and when I say hunter-gatherer bands I mean that that was their main activity. They were hunting and they were gathering plant foods. They probably lived in uh, their in very small bands actually, maybe um, only a couple of brothers and their families. And then in the winter, they might even have split into smaller groups, maybe even a nuclear family, a um, mother, father, and children. Because it would have been difficult without foods that, you, that one grows, in other words, before the introduction of crops. You can't store food, so therefore you have to hunt constantly and, and find enough food to feed your family. There are actual house structures on the site. They're very small house structures, maybe only uh, two or three meters across, that would house one or two families of four people. And we have found a number of dogs as well that were probably hunting companions and then given very kind of meaningful burials. They're laid in their, on their sides in the pits. And at this particular period in time, we're seeing some of the first dogs we see in the archaeological record. Meadowood period is one that's very similar to Genesee in that people are hunting and gathering and fishing and moving to this site in particular to do some of those activities but mainly to acquire the flint that they need to make their stone tools and then as we've seen in many cases to also bury their dead because it's such a beautiful place and probably because it's such a meaningful place. One of the absolute hallmarks of this period are very finely crafted preforms or blanks for projectile points, but they are so thin, they're literally usually under a couple of millimeters in thickness, and they all look very similar, and sometimes they're found where dozens of them are in the same pit. We call them cache blades because they're placed in a pit as a cache, and they're never retrieved. So we're wondering if they're offerings um, perhaps in some kind of reference to the fact that flint itself is the blood of the gods. There's some cultural reason for producing the object quite that nicely. It's more or less an expression of the character of the people, their, 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 their spiritual state. And when we're very resolved, beauty is the result and refinement. Because we're at peace and we're very calm and, and and our objects reflect that kind of refinement. The very first projectile points found in North America are called Clovis points. They're fluted and they are absolutely gorgeous and they are an equivalent with the kinds of points that are found now 9,000 years later. So in between that they go through stages where they're incredibly crude and thick but we believe that there are cultural reasons why those are made in that fashion. It's not so much that they lost the art, it's that culture, kind of the trends, the style, demanded that they be created in that fashion. Some people might find the bell-bottom pant not to be that attractive and not to, 
not to represent the hallmark of pant design. Yet, we've gone through stages where they've appeared, disappeared, and then reappeared. And that's pretty much the same kind of thing as we're looking at here, where a style which, which represents what we believe to be an exquisite uh, manufacturing process, it disappears for a while, in this case thousands of years, and then reappears as beautiful pieces that are offered to gods and then also used to make stone tools. The other artifact from that time period that has been found is a ground slate object in the form of an animal, which we refer to as a birdstone. The object is, um, is, as you can see, about five inches long. It's made of what's called banded slate, and it's, uh, it has a, a tail and a long beak and an eye, and it, it probably is in the pose as if it were in water. Um, kind of like a duck or some uh, a bird of that nature. You can see that there are holes on the base of the object and these holes would have been used to attach it to the uh, spear throwing device so that it would have been a weight on that device. It's an absolutely startling object uh, and as you can see at the same time as it had a function it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute piece of art. This is not something that they would make ordinarily, Ron? I mean... Well, out of a half a million artifacts that have been found at the Peace Bridge, this is the only one of its nature. Half a million artifacts? More, th more than a half a million artifacts. It's a, it would be common to the area, or don't you know that? Um, well, n none of these are ever common. Um, they're, they're known for this period between 300 and 800 BC, but uh, even then, uh, there certainly were not hun hundreds of these made even. There were maybe dozens of them made for the, the whole period across the entire Northeast. So they're, they're fairly rare. And to find one is, is just wonderful. The other thing um, about the Meadowood period, or more broadly we call it also the early woodland period, is that people uh, at that period lavish upon the burials lots of objects that are obviously important to the society, like the bird stones or um, in, in some cases also what we call blocked end stone tube pipes. Now uh, there was one example at the Peace Bridge site that was found with the burial of a person uh, in the Peace Bridge Plaza. The body was not excavated, it was left where it was and the, the pipe is exactly where it was found with that person and will be forever. It's a long hollowed out tube of stone, ground stone, that narrows in one end and they put a pebble in the large end down to the narrow end and they put their plant material that's going to be smoked in the large end and then as they inhale from the small end the pebble prevents any of the grass burning material to enter the mouth of the smoker and they just get the smoke. So it's very early smoking pipe technology and it's an object of great ceremonial value that is buried with the person. The curious thing about this pipe was that it was made from a limestone from Ohio and it shows you the long distance that materials and goods are traded through various band networks even that long ago that we, we estimate that's something like three, 300 to 500 BC so well over 2000 years ago you would be wrong if you thought that that people were very insular in their small bands at this time they weren't they had contacts that far exceeded their even local environment I think when we look at a site like Fort Erie, we, we, have to, we have to see it as a layering of cultures. And because it was a, a fairly rare natural resource, it would have been visited by people from different cultures and different nations. They would have had to have some kind of an agreement to share there. So it was probably a place of storytelling, of, 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 of sharing uh, different practices, uh, sharing knowledge, uh, sharing, you know, ways we dress and all of that. The next major occupation of the site is the transitional woodland period, which is signaled largely by the introduction of maize, which happens in southern Ontario at around AD 500. We find that maize has come up the Mississippi Valley into Ontario. This signals a fairly significant change to the lifestyle of people because up until that point in time, there was no way to gather enough food to store to stay in one place. Well, with corn, and once they learned the technology, and it took at least 500 years to learn that, the very first base settlements or villages we see are around 1000 AD. 
So from its introduction at 300 or 500 AD, it takes almost a half a millennium for people to develop the technology, to develop the skills, to grow enough corn for people to stay in one place for the entire year. This also means because they can store food together, they can live together throughout the year in one place and the community size starts to, starts to change. We get bigger sites with more people in them for longer periods of time. The house structures change as well and, and that is reflected on the Peace Bridge site where we see the early longhouse form where there may be five meters or six meters wide and maybe 20 or 30 meters long and several families live in these. These would be kind of made out of saplings and then covered in bark so they're like long bark houses that people live in. All of this is the early form of what we know to be the Iroquoian lifestyle that the first European explorers and missionaries witnessed when they came here. The transitional woodland period also has a point style that is particular to that period which is small triangular points with one barb that seems to be a little bit longer and they also have very distinctive pots. Um, pottery by this period is becoming far more refined the way that the pots are made and their shape starts to change and at the Peacebridge site we found just an absolutely spectacular vessel. Pretty clearly what had happened is that the vessel had collapsed one day with its soup inside it and here we come back centuries later and find the pieces of pottery and as we lift off the pieces of pottery there is the last meal as is reflected in the bones of the fish and the objects that were in the pot. The future of the Peace Bridge site is directly tied to its past. Further development will call for more archaeological examination, and with that work will come continued interpretation. Every artifact or burial that is found will continue to reshape our thinking about those who came to the site. And perhaps that is how it should be. The site will continue to live and have new meaning. People were there for thousands of years. This has been very important to Aboriginal people today who are living in the community, which is a constant reminder that the archaeology we're conducting on that site is the archaeology of a living people. I began to realize that there's a lot of evidence of our way of life that we would never be able to reconnect with without archaeology. I think it will mean the, the, the recovery of our relationship to our own past, which will inevitably lead to a deeper, richer, and happier culture. It's important when we interpret the site that that interpretation leads to an understanding on the general public that this archaeology is about the past, but it's also about the future. <laughs>